More than 25,000 members strong, the American Public Health Association is the premier association speaking out for public health issues and policies backed by science. As the best and the brightest from the APHA gather in Georgia for the 2023 annual meeting and expo, APHA TV is bringing it all right to your fingertips. Welcome back to the Georgia World Congress Center in Atlanta. I'm Deidre Johnson and this is APHA TV. On this fourth and final day, we are covering the major challenges affecting public health, everything from climate issues to reproductive rights. Many providers are leaving states where there are abortion restrictions and bans. And what this does is it further leads to a lack of access for people who are typically already underserved. We go in depth on what the future of reproductive care looks like with Regina Davis, Moss, and Don Godbold. We saw this need to address the urgent uh, issues that communities are facing right now, but also to build this pipeline uh, to make sure that we have community health workers in the future. Plus, APHA is working diligently to build an innovative, diverse, and effective health workforce. We'll show you how. Before COVID, I think that we were just starting to grapple with these issues. But COVID just exponentially increased the pressure on the workforce. And we wrap things up with the institutions and universities blazing new trails in the quest to make this the healthiest nation. APHA TV is packing a punch on this fourth and final day, and we want to make sure you never miss a minute. You can always find the latest APHA TV episode playing on the TVs throughout the convention center, on the in-house channels at several of our partner hotels, on the APHA website where you can click through the video playlist to find even more exclusive meeting content and on our YouTube and X pages, formerly known as Twitter. What are some of the biggest challenges we need to address to be able to build and support the workforce that is needed in the United States and abroad? Let's see how organizations are coming together to answer that very question. We need to meet the public in the communities that they live. We need to meet all people. So we need a diverse workforce. Uh, so. The, the workers in public health look like the communities that we're serving, that they can speak the language, that they understand the culture. When you have a diverse workforce, you increase the likelihood that someone like myself might be able to connect with a specific community or group uh, and help relay public health initiatives and messages in ways that are just a little bit more uh, easier to understand or, or empathetic. We need to make sure that we're working hard to reduce barriers that might stand in the way so that the public health workforce actually looks like the rich, diverse American community that we have. The public health workforce has been under-resourced uh, for decades. Uh, we saw that unfold during the pandemic in a, in a really big way. Um, we need to take that lesson learned and apply it. Because again, if you have a strong workforce, then you in fact will have the prevention that will save the dollars because we are out of control with healthcare costs. Philanthropy has an incredible role to play uh, in, in advancing public health and helping the, the workforce. We've seen that play out uh, specifically in the state of Indiana, uh, the Fairbanks Foundation that led to the legislature this spring unleashing new uh, state funding for local public health in the millions of dollars. Philanthropy's just got so much power, but it's more powerful if it's with a vision for the, the outcome that our nation needs. I lost my job during the pandemic. Um, and while I had that time, uh, I wanted to do something. Um, and I just didn't know what that was. I knew I wanted to help. And finding Public Health AmeriCorps, for me, gave me the tools and the knowledge and gave me the confidence to get out in the community and, and make some effective change. I was able to get out in Skid Row in Los Angeles and bring resources to them, COVID test, uh, vaccination, uh, scheduling and, and information on how to access vaccine clinics, uh, food distribution, really bring those, uh, all these different important initiatives to communities that are, again, hard to reach. 
AmeriCorps is the federal agency for volunteering and national service. We have about 200,000 AmeriCorps members and AmeriCorps senior volunteers that are serving in more than 40,000 locations across the country. And so as we look at the gap in the public health workforce, 80,000 missing workers, we saw this need to address the urgent uh, issues that communities are facing right now, but also to build this pipeline uh, to make sure that we have community health workers in the future. We are moving more AmeriCorps members today to address urgent uh, local health needs, but we're also building the career pathways. And so we're doing training while you're serving. You are learning and serving at the same time. We now have about 3,000 public health AmeriCorps members on a path to 7,000. And we not only are gonna make a difference right now in communities, but I believe we're gonna change the face of, of the public health workforce. I really would love to see the day that we have uh, a, a diverse and well-trained workforce in public health uh, that can really put into action the power, the power of prevention. The truth is, if we lift all communities, we lift everyone. Healthy Gamer is a mental health platform that provides educational resources, community resources, and peer support for the digital generation. HG educates on emerging mental health issues, promotes mental wellness, and provides affordable and accessible coaching services to individuals in need. Healthy Gamer is a digital mental health platform that's designed to help especially young people with the problems of the digital age. We do everything from psychoeducation on our Twitch and YouTube channels, as well as community-run events that help people learn some of the skills that kids in the digital age have difficulty developing. And we also have a peer support program that helps people with things like forming social connections, finding direction in life. We think it's really important to meet people where they're at, in their language, in their online spaces, where they're talking about their anxiety or their isolation or their loneliness on places like Discord and Twitch. That's where we want to be. We want to spread psychoeducation about different mental health conditions to 10,000, a million people in one shot. There is a huge movement for better mental health, for breaking down social barriers, and I think it's creating a huge cultural shift and it's been beautiful. All this week we've been discussing the pressure the public health system is under to modernize and be responsive to new and ongoing public health threats. Joining us now in studio is Ajay Gupta and Esti Garrity to discuss how we make that happen. Well, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thanks, DJ. Thanks so, for having us. Talk to me first off about some of these public health challenges that we're facing. I think we're seeing there are emerging threats that are coming all the time. So public health needs to be more agile in order to constantly respond to new challenges. And each new challenge requires a plethora of data resources. And those data resources may come from highly disparate sources. So integrating the data in a way that makes it easier for public health to respond and use the data and be efficient is another challenge. So solutions nowadays really need to be scalable. You could look at, of course, COVID and the Johns Hopkins dashboard. I know that that dashboard at the height of the pandemic was receiving over 450 billion hits per day. That's more scale than most public health departments feel they can manage. So they need technologies and, and solutions that are able to scale with today's threats. And so talk to me also now about disruptive technologies and what that has to do with public health system. Well, there really are a lot of disruptive technologies. For instance, using biotech and machine learning mechanisms to increase the speed of new drug discovery holds a lot of promise. Right? Hopefully we can get new drugs to treat illnesses at less cost. Uh, there are also other ways to be innovative. Maybe use a drone to deliver medications mm -hmm. to places that aren't served by a local pharmacy. But I think one of the things, and we were even trying to work on this ourselves, is having what we see as a ChatGPT style generative AI system as a front end to our public health analytics resources. Right now to do public health analytics, you really kind of need either coding or true data science, data analytics skills, right? And that's a barrier because not everybody has that. But if we can create a prompt style conversational interface to that data, then we can unleash all of the data insights to everyone. 
So instead of having to do advanced analysis to find out where heat health is going to be impacted, imagine if you could just ask a question, where in Paris are gonna be the hardest hit areas from a heat wave next year? That would be a game changer. And I think that's the kind of solution we need in public health. AI is pretty new to us, at least the generative AI. And we need to be able to monitor that and correct it and train it properly. But there are also some things, perhaps we'll see, that um, generative AI can't do. And I still like the human touch when it comes to health concerns. People are are worried often, um, or they have complex issues that aren't as easily solved. Um, so I think we, we continue to have room for both, um, but I love, I love your vision. I think it's really well, amazing. Uh, you're right, the technology is not a replacement, it's a tool that we use. So it's great here being at APHA where there's 13,000 public health experts. Absolutely, we all have to learn how to use technology in a way that makes our jobs, our capacities better. But does, it doesn't mean that we want next year's conference to have only 2,000 people. <laughs> we do want to grow the field also. Yeah. All right, and so talk to me about cybersecurity and the role of cybersecurity with the public health system and how it really impacts everything. Yeah, I see cybersecurity as that thing that is always modulating, it's always changing, it's always adapting to the mechanisms that we're doing to try to keep data safe. I think one thing that I would recommend to everybody, whether they are building a technical solution or using a technical solution, is to consider all of the compliance measures like high trust as a starting point for discussion on security, not the end point, right? Mm -hmm. So you certainly should leverage all of your technology partners, whether it's cloud hosting or a service provider for what they can do. Now I'd say also as a population health company as we are, we do have a little bit of an advantage because we're using broad sets of aggregated data across the population and not individual data on a person. So that does change a little bit of the posture of our security risk, but it is again something that you have to think through on an ongoing basis. Okay, and what is the future you know, of public health? What can people look forward to? What are we seeing, whether it's modernization, cybersecurity, or just moving forward? What can people look forward to? We are at an inflection point now where we do see the advent of great new technologies coming to public health, coming to the world in general, right? Whether it's biotech, whether it's genetic, whether it is artificial intelligence like generative AI that is going to change how we can do the work. And we also, at the other, on the other side of the, the ledger, we see a, a vast growth in the disease factors, right? We know deforestation and increases the risk of zoonotic spillover, like COVID, like monkeypox. We also see antimicrobial resistance happening on a scale that wouldn't have anticipated even 10 years ago. So we, we do see both factors changing. And so where is the future? Well, I, I think it's going to come down to whether we as, as a society, as whether all of us, have the will to put the, in place mm -hmm. these measures. You know, it's going to take collaboration. No country can fight a global pandemic by themselves. Are we going to collaborate? Are we going to create economic models that enable the deployment of these large solutions? Or are we not? And then are we going to be susceptible to small diseases becoming big problems? Public health is getting some more dollars after COVID, but never enough dollars. So how do you do more with less? How do you achieve the vision of equity, of being preventive and proactive um, when you have the same amount of resources and magnifying problems? Um, you need the support of technologies that are vetted and can do a good job for you um, and streamline processes. So. The world is evolving and the challenges will keep changing. I think we will continue to get closer to achieving that vision. Okay, I want to thank you all so much for being here and for talking to us about public health and everything. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Deidre. Thank you for having us. COVID-19 placed incredible strain on health systems and the people who work in them. However, burnout and moral injury were rising even before the pandemic resulted in incredible harm for workers and the people they serve. The Fitzhugh Mullen Institute for Health Workforce Equity is advocating for better policies to create better working and learning environments and ultimately better health care and public safety. Burnout and moral injury is a huge problem among health professionals, uh, primarily because it's leading to people quitting and we need those people to serve patients. Caring for patients day in and day out can be emotionally draining, especially when you don't feel that you have adequate support. March of 2022, the Dr. Lorna Breen Healthcare Provider Protection Act was passed and signed by the president. That resulted in 44 grants to address this issue, as well as the Technical Assistance Center, the Workplace Change Collaborative. 
being able to meet with the other grantees helps motivation, knowing that you're not the only one doing this work. They provide us access to a network of experts, resources, platforms to share research findings and best practices. We've built an interactive website to help people both frame the challenges um, and then to find the resources to be able to start to make change in their organization. Find us online and reach out to us. Climate change plays a significant role in public health on a global scale. Athenas Mena from Clean Air Now is sitting down with us to discuss how we can be better prepared. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. So talk to us about you know, climate change and you know, its impact really on public health. Sure. So climate change is like this big monster that everyone just likes to toss and turn about. But honestly, climate change, when you think about it, it creates different severe weather impacts. It could increase vector-borne diseases. It increases heat impacts for our workers, for people who work outside. And then also when you think about like the air pollution that's currently going on because of hot fossil fuel industry and the lifestyle that we're living, climate change is only like being exacerbated even more from that. So it really has an impact on the public health system. Talk to me more about that. Sure, so what we're seeing is because of like the vector-borne diseases, we're seeing diseases like earlier in the year, um, we're seeing diseases where they weren't really going on in the past. We're also seeing a lot of like respiratory problems, cardiovascular problems. That is something that with health, uh, it's not always something that is asked about. You get asked, how are you eating? How are you working out? But are they asking you about how climate change is impacting uh, your neighborhood, how uh, air pollution or water quality could be impacting your health? And so that's something that uh, now more and more is being seen as a question that needs to be asked and further explored to take care of our lives and our health. And so talk to me about Clean Air Now and you know how are we all really trying to make an impact? Sure, so Clean Air Now is an environmental justice organization and we're located in Kansas City, Kansas. It was actually started by community members, like actual residents that were starting to have symptoms and problems with their breathing. They were also noticing a lot of soup build up around in their neighborhood, on their windows. And they were asking, does this impact my health? How is this going to impact my children? And they realized that they're right next to the second largest rail hub in the nation. They're right next to many industries, risk management plan facilities that are working with very toxic chemicals that can be cancer causing. And they're right next to highways, diesel trucks. So when you think about it, they have a uh, uh, a surplus, right, of pollution being concentrated in one area. And that's what Clean Air Now is working toward, is toward advocating for everyone should have the right to clean air, water, and land. And how do we make those changes? Instead of just asking that community member, well, move. No, that's not the answer. What the answer lies is on better regulation, zoning practices, policies that could be put in place, and health providers can better understand how the environment impacts the health of their patients and how they can also play a pivotal role in making some of those greater systemic changes. And so it's one of the reasons why you're here at the APHA annual meeting and expo to raise awareness about this and talk to me about you know what you all hope people will find out and learn as they're here. Yeah, well, it's considered the number one uh, health crisis of the world, and this is impacting not only people from outside of the United States, it's literally impacting specific zip codes that are throughout the U.S., that we have vulnerable populations like our children, the elderly, people who work outside, people with, like we mentioned, many different chronic diseases. And it, it's just another part of like the social determinants of health, right? So we, when we say social determinants of health, it means what in your environment, what are you being exposed to, and then also your education, the access to food, the access to uh, good uh, good paying jobs to be able to be able to work and make a living. Uh, we need to take all of those things into account to be a more holistic approach to how we provide health care. So how can public health professionals really get involved and help you? 
since we're stationed in Kansas City, we work on local, state, and federal level policies. We um, try to work on civic engagement and the importance of how community members' voices need to be at decision-making tables. And what healthcare providers can do is reach out to Clean Air Now, attend some of our meetings, attend our events, meet us where the community is at, and better understand what are the concerns of the community. We've done door-to-door -door surveys with community. We've established a good uh, trusting uh, partnership with them, work with us to see what research do we still need, what resources can we allocate, and then how can we advance and use your health expertise to advance some of those strong policies. Well, thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for talking to us about climate change. Thank you so much for having me. The National Mass Violence Center, NMVC, stands as an unwavering beacon of support and healing for victims, survivors, and families affected by the devastating aftermath of mass violence incidents. Let's take a closer look at the impactful services and support they have provided and continue to provide. Mass violence is a public health and public safety problem. There are, unfortunately, major ripple effects of mass violence. As a result of that, nobody really feels safe and no place feels safe to us because of who we are, what we believe, who we worship, who we love, or what we look like. The National Mass Violence Center was established in 2017 uh, with a cooperative agreement grant from the Office for Victims of Crime in the U.S. Department of Justice. Our mission is to help the Office for Victims of Crime improve community preparedness and the nation's capacity to serve victims recovering from mass violence. When the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, it sent shockwaves throughout the country and as many still questioning what the future of reproductive care looks like here in the United States. Regina Davis-Moss and Don Godbull are here now to discuss where things stand. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having us. Hey, thank you. So let's talk about reproductive rights. Right now, we're a little bit post, what, 16 months past the Dobbs decision. So talk to me, where do reproductive rights really stand right now? Sure. So I think 18 months post-Dobbs, what we're seeing across the landscape is exactly what we thought would happen. Women and birthing people are having difficulty accessing comprehensive reproductive health care. We hear stories repeatedly of women who are denied um, health care for an abortion or pregnancy loss. We're hearing there's difficulty in reaching contraception. The other thing that we're seeing is a significant impact on workforce, the perinatal birth workforce. What we're seeing is many providers are leaving states where there are abortion restrictions and bans. And what this does is it further leads to a lack of access for people who are typically already underserved. And now this decision, unfortunately, it's impacting, you know, they say poor women, women of color and everything. So what can, you know, people do really? Okay, so there are a couple of ways that we move forward. I think one bright spot that we're seeing is the way that people are showing up at the polls. People across the country have made it very clear that they want access to choice, the freedom of choice in deciding your own reproductive health destiny. Um, and so when we're thinking about where do we go from here, when we use a reproductive justice approach to understanding the maternal health crisis, we piece together access to contraception, and supports that people need in order to really provide a healthy and sustainable life for their, their children, their offspring. And so using a reproductive justice approach is going to let us take into account housing, food security, economic justice, the criminal justice system. All of the factors are what we might call social determinants of health that are going to have an impact. And when we look at the historical um, record of why Black women's birth outcomes have been so poor, it's systemic issues. And so we're talking about bias in the um, healthcare field. We're talking about a lack 
of perinatal birth workers. We are talking about closed economic systems that do not allow us to attain wealth or pass assets on in a generational manner that would allow us to have access to those supports that improve maternal health. And now speaking of that, there was the recent statistics show that infant and also maternal mortality is really, just those statistics are alarming. You know, what can we do as far as how can we deal with this and then move forward? Well, I wanted to say the solutions are there. So my organization, every two years, we release a reproductive justice policy agenda that is over 100 policy recommendations and solutions. Mm -hmm. It literally is the blueprint. So if you go to it, you're gonna find the policy solutions, solutions there. But we also talk about, I mean, we've said it, doulas, midwives, black nurses, increasing and, di and diversifying the workforce are things that we definitely need to do. Um, we need to pass legislation. The momnibus has uh, been something we've been championing, and we need to make sure that that happens. She can't say it, but I'm going to pump up in our own voice is one of our leading reproductive justice organizations in this country. And so if you are looking for a place to get started, it's right here. There are people who are organizing, people who are developing policy solutions, and people who are working with Black women, Black midwives, and Black doulas, really harnessing that community power. We have the solutions. We have the leaders. What we need are structural changes that usually come through policy like the Momnibus to really move us to a place of optimal health or at least parity in health outcomes. And now, is there anything to be hopeful about for reproductive rights and how can people help? Well, I mean, we saw the overwhelming turnout, so we should be hopeful that that's going to continue to happen. I think we've already seen a number of states that are going to try to pass ballot measures. But we can't rest on this, right? Because what we've realized is that uh, conservatives typically will move the goalposts, right? So they'll mm -hmm. find another way to try to get to where their goal is. And so their goal, in my mind, is to try to fundamentally dismantle our rights to bodily autonomy, and we're just not gonna have it. And anything else you want to add? One, voter turnout is very important. This is an issue that everybody cares about because we all have a reproductive health journey that should be our own to make decisions about. Um, I think the other thing to really be excited about, I've talked about in our own voice, there's also the Black Mamas Matters Alliance. They are one of the leading organizing advocacy agencies, or I'm sorry, organizations in the country for reproductive justice. And so this is where you're going to understand and learn how to get involved, what is the messaging, how to even just connect with other community-based leaders who are doing their best to be that voice for the people who need it the most. So there are plenty of opportunities to get involved. You can champion the Black Maternal Health Momnibus. Um, you can donate some funds to orgs who are doing the good work. Um, and you can continue to talk about the subject. And, and I can't forget that you can become a reproductive justice voter. And what that means is voting with that lens not in just national elections, but every election, every year down the ballot. So if you care about things like who is teaching curriculum, that is why you need to be educated and you want to vote with people, vote for people with that, that reflect your values. Because when we vote that way, then we have a democracy that reflects diversity and it also reflects what we want and what we need. Dawn and Regina, thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for your thoughts on this important issue. Thanks for having me. Sticking with the reproductive rights topic, the Male Contraceptive Initiative is a small nonprofit based in Durham, North Carolina, that currently serves as the second largest funder of male contraceptive research in the world. Let's take a look at how they have unlocked the myth that men are not interested in having better contraceptive options. Male Contraceptive Initiative's mission is to provide men and their partners with more opportunities to have reproductive autonomy, which means really being able to protect themselves, their relationships, and each other from unintended pregnancy. Why we don't have male contraceptives on the market today is really driven by a misbelief that the science is too challenging as well as this notion that women should be responsible for, you know, shouldering family planning responsibilities. With more male contraceptives on the market, we're hoping that that paradigm will shift and that we'll have a more equitable understanding of 
who uh, contributes to family planning objectives. I think the future of male contraception is really exciting to think about. It's a blank canvas right now with so many products in early development, but it's going to look very similar to what we see for female contraception. There's no one size fits all. Uh, contraceptive needs change throughout a person's lifespan. You know, your reproductive journey is, is very unique on an individual basis. So we really want to have a, a suite of options available for people to use. The University of Houston's premier initiative is fighting prescription drug misuse through education and innovation. Particularly focusing on opioids, the center focuses on emphasizing retention in opioid use disorder treatment, unbiased prescription drug monitoring, and safe medication dispensing and disposal. The Prescription Drug Misuse Education Research Center at the University of Houston College of Pharmacy is focused on improving patient outcomes related to prescription drug misuse. We are a very transdisciplinary team from pharmacy, medicine, public health, psychology, counseling. We address a number of different types of addictions, opiate use disorder, prescription drug misuse, and all of the things that are sort of related to it, including mental health issues, access to care, equity in care. Our Educate Before You Medicate project provided an education toolkit and safe disposal options for prescription drugs in order to ensure good outcomes for their patients. But at the same time, it also gave us good data on barriers and different issues that these pharmacists faced in helping take care of these patients. And that would help us inform our future education and research efforts as well. We wanna make sure that the problems facing Americans today are solved with the help of researchers at Premier. As we wrap up a wonderful week here in Atlanta, we want to hear from you. What has been your highlight this week at APHA? And what do you hope to take back home to your community? Take a listen. It's really great to know what people are doing in the field and really get to get connected with folks and their research projects that are going on both locally, nationally, and globally. I mean, it's like the public health hub. If you're in public health, you gotta be here. The work we do is very hard and difficult, so these types of networks are really helpful to uh, kind of, you go back really invigorated and revitalized, ready to uh, do some great work. I would say the community is really great, and being able to have like-minded individuals and also see people that look like you doing the work, it's really invaluable if you really care about what you're doing. I'm definitely going to be taking home a little bit more confidence as an early career professional. This is just an incredible opportunity to not only present, but also just meet so many people in the field in the United States and, and all over the world. I'm using all of this, everything I've learned to really pad the studies I'm doing now. I'm using it to talk to my professors and begin dialogue that I don't think the other students in my college right now are really getting. Es bueno venir a estos espacios porque aquí nos conectamos todos y aquí podemos compartir y encontrar nuevos socios, nuevos uh, colaboradores que puedan interesarse en hacer el trabajo para la comunidad que es a la que estamos sirviendo. We love hearing straight from you about all the wonderful things you've enjoyed this week. And we've loved having you join us here on APHA TV. We may be wrapping up, but our content lives on. All the interviews, pieces, and highlights from this last week are still live on our YouTube and X pages. Feel free to share or go back and rewatch any portion of APHA TV that you might have missed. Thanks again for your time and attention this week, and we look forward to joining you once again next year. We hope to see you in Minneapolis.